Um, hi, everyone, and thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Gregory. I really appreciate it. Um, so I, I have an ambitious presentation today. I'm hoping to cover a lot of topics with everyone and excited to, yeah, as Gregory said, leave some conversation time at the end for questions and thoughts. Um, but yeah, I've titled the presentation today, Marketing Soup, <laughs> which I think I thought maybe was kind of funny, um, but also this is really something that we hear a lot from our clients at Press Post, and sometimes how I feel too, working uh, in this crazy world of marketing. Um, sometimes it feels like this is what it's like navigating this land of all these different marketing tactics and tools and terms. And really, you know, what does it all mean? There's advertising, there's PR, there's digital marketing, there's content. There's so many terms. And, you know, over my career, I've been working in this industry for 15 years it has changed so much. And so many of these areas have become much more specialized, um, which makes it really challenging, especially for smaller brands to kind of, to navigate the waters, navigate the soup waters um, and figure out, you know, where do they need to focus their efforts? So my hope today is to kind of demystify, I think some of the terms we hear in marketing buzz and lingo and, and help you kind of focus maybe where you're gonna get the best bang for your buck um, and, and what areas I think a lot of brands, the, the best brands, where they kind of focus that maybe other brands don't. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to dive right in here. So I had, uh, <laughs> oh, here, I already went through this. So what is the difference between branding, PR, and advertising? We'll chat about that. I'm going to give lots and lots of examples today to kind of help inspire you um, with your own companies and, and marketing plans. Um, and then, yeah, how do we harness all of these ingredients to actually grow and scale um, or reach our goals? And then uh, ask me anything at the end. So I originally had a slide here that was like, here's our services. This is what we do at Press and Post. And then I was like, this is so boring. So I thought, how would I just show you? This is the kind of work, this is the work we do that gets me out of bed in the morning. And this is why I actually really, really love working uh, in marketing and communication. So um, I'll just show a few examples. So you can kind of see how we use all of these marketing ingredients to make magic happen. So um, a project I was very lucky to work on actually is a bit of a one woman show in 2018. Um, I got a call from a crazy guy, uh, Michael Maxis, who said, I wanna build a six story mule in Old Strathcona and I need to raise $100,000 in four weeks, can you help me? These are the kinds of calls I love. <laughs> so I got to work and in four weeks we did it. So we did a crazy media blitz across the city. We leaned into our contacts with influencers and just our media relations. And we caused uh, what we call like a media blitz for four weeks straight. I think there was over like 40 media placements in that time. Um, and the whole city was talking about this project. And yeah, we raised $100,000 uh, to bring this mural to life, um, which will be able to be enjoyed you know, for, for decades to come. Um, we do things like this. We put eight-year-old Kate on billboards across Edmonton uh, to celebrate Alopecia Awareness Month and raise much needed funds for research around the autoimmune disorder. This is a campaign we just did last September with a local company called Sweet Jolie. Um, her, the owner, her daughter's name, or her daughter is Kate. Um, and we, we've been working on this campaign for about four years. And this was one that was really close to my heart. So what we did, um, we literally put Kate on billboards across the city. We invited media and her friends and family to see uh, her. She came blindfolded to the, <laughs> to the billboard. We took off the blindfold um, and we captured her response and uh, lots and lots of media coverage, obviously. Um, and we were able to do some really, really positive work uh, around this campaign. Oh, oh no. Let's see if I can get this. Oh, shoot. Well, in here, I think I had changed toothpaste in here. Okay, well, we'll have to skip that. That's too bad. Um, so really, how do we do these things? How do we make these campaigns work? How do we get them to really, really positive results? Um, and this is it really simplified. You build a brand, you tell people about it, and then you keep telling people about it forever. <laughs> so it sounds simple, but it is hard. Um, and it's a lifelong journey for every brand. Um, you don't ever get to stop marketing. Um, you have to keep going and you have to kind of adjust with the times and, and figure out where your audience is and, and just keep hitting them over the head. So um, again, I'm gonna demystify this a bit. So let's start with the foundational element. And this is something I really, really wanna emphasize today, building a brand. So often we say to people, 
you know, think of a brand. They'll say things, the top of mind is like Nike, Coca-Cola, um, Google, people often say these are like the legacy brands that people think of when they think of brand. But really, like, what is brand? When we say that, what the heck are we talking about? Um, it's not a logo. I guess that's what I want to say. You know, we look at this, we instantly know it's Nike. It's like the infamous logo um, that they've been able to, to leverage for years. Um, but this really, this is not, a, this is not brand. This is, we're getting closer. So the just do it language, I think Nike introduced probably, it was like around 1988. Um, and this is getting closer to what we're really talking about when we're talking about the foundational element of your company, which is building the brand and really investing and knowing who you are, what you stand for, and then building from there. Um, so this language, obviously Nike has, it's, it's, informed everything they've basically done as a company for the last 30 years. Um, so from partnerships with Michael Jordan to Serena Williams to Kaepernick, um, this is, you know, knowing who they are as a company and knowing that they want to partner, for example, with athletes um, that have this just do it, you know, just go for it kind of attitude. It actually makes their marketing kind of easy because they know who they are and they, they know what they represent. Um, so this is the reason I'm kind of really emphasizing this is I think sometimes a lot of um, companies, we see them get really hung up on things like, you know, the logo. Um, but really what's important is identifying, I guess these three things is what I, I like to simplify. Your values, your purpose, and then your personality. And so I think, you know, we understand what most of these means. Your values is, you know, what do you stand for? At Press and Post, we have a set of values that we kind of abide by, empathy, creativity, and driving impact. Um, we always look back to that as sort of like our Bible of, you know, when we're making decisions, what do we value? What is our purpose? You know, there's a reason you either started a company or joined a company. What is the purpose? Why are you there? Um, and how are you communicating that to both like your team as well as the public is really, really important. Um, and then what's your personality? Are you academic? Are you highly professional? Are you silly? Are you weird? Are you quirky? Um, really taking the time to nail this down either as an entrepreneur yourself or with a marketing team or actually your whole leadership team really is so essential. And I can say that previously, I'd say like earlier on in my career, I feel like often we would kind of get excited to work with a client because we really saw the vision and we were inspired by what they would do, what they were ready to do. But we knew their brand wasn't quite there and they didn't really have the answers to these questions or the brand presence created yet. And we would run, we would go, okay, we're gonna employ all the marketing tactics and get going. And we would get results. But typically if we pause and say, you know what, the brand isn't there yet and spend some time really getting this foundation set, you're going to be so much more successful. Um, I just can't emphasize this enough. So if you haven't got this done yet, make sure you spend the time. Um, I don't think you need to, to be honest, like hire a fancy agency to get these answers. I think a team can sit down and, and figure that out or an entrepreneur um, where you might need some support from like a freelancer or a graphic designer or an agency like at Press and Post is bringing that brand to life. So that is when we talk about visual identity. You know, what does your photography look like? What is your logo? What does your website look like? All of that stuff is super, super important before you start spending money on marketing and advertising um you could be drawing all this traffic to yourself but it's not actually going to convert at the end of the day because there's no brand consistency so i have down here at the bottom weaving this into everything you do so when we say that i again i'm not just talking about your look your website your your logo it's you know when someone walks into your store what's the experience they get when you're training your staff, how, how are you training them? What is that experience like for them? Does it speak to these three things? Um, when someone does visit your website, what is the customer experience like there? And once all of this is more solidified, and it can always be a little bit evolving, but once it's solidified, it's sort of magic. All of a sudden you're attracting all the right customers. You're attracting all the right team members, employees, like recruitment comes easy. Like once this is set, kind of in your mind and everyone's on the same page, it just makes marketing and business honestly easier and more fluid because you, you just know where you're grounded and where you're starting from. So 
I'll stop harping on that. <laughs> so once we have the brand in place, we figured it out, we're ready to rock. This is when we start telling people about what we're trying to do and actually outreach and, and marketing. So I'm gonna dive in to public relations. Um, I'm not gonna go into like the full sphere of public relations, um, but there, there's two kind of topics I think that get really mysterious for people, specifically garnering media coverage and influencer marketing. So I'm, I'm gonna to touch on those two today and I hope that's really helpful for everyone um, on the call. Um, so what the heck is PR? I know when I started out, um, I heard of this thing called public relations and I knew that Samantha Jones from Sex and the City worked in PR and she was on red carpets and she seemed to work with celebrities and seemed very glamorous. Um, and then I, I took the PR program at McEwen and entered my career and realized uh, it's actually quite different. So this is the very kind of boring description. PR is the practice of managing the spread of information between an individual or organization and the public. This is very boring. Here's how I like to describe PR. And this is how I've described it to all of my clients over the past you know, 10 years. And it's a quote that I'm borrowing. Um, advertising is you saying you're good. PR is getting someone else to say you're good. So I'll let that kind of digest for a second. Basically the difference, it's kind of saying, here's the difference between advertising and PR. PR is, and this is the metaphor I use a lot. Imagine you showed up at a party. When, oh, I can't wait to go to parties again, but imagine you show up to a party and you arrive and you start, you know, you're walking around the room and you're introducing yourself to people and you're saying, hi, you know, I'm Janice and I don't know if you've heard, but I am very cool. Okay. I don't know how well that would go, but imagine this. So you walk into the room at a party and you're, there's two people in the corner and one turns to the other and says, oh, Janice just arrived. I don't know if you know her, but she's actually really cool. That's the difference. And so the argument, um, especially people who love PR like me, <laughs> is that one is actually more credible and can be much more effective than the other. That doesn't mean that these other tools and like advertising don't have a play. They absolutely do. Um, but these things need to work complementary together. Um, and PR is a very, very valuable tool um, in creating that kind of word of mouth marketing, which is highly, highly credible, um, really supports and strengthens your credibility in the market that you're working in drives awareness. It's really good for SEO typically. Um, it's just a really important tool that a lot of people I feel don't hurt us. So I hope that helps demystify a bit, but we will get into some examples as well. Um, so again, when we're talking about PR, these are typically the kinds of things in our PR toolbox that fall under this category. So garnering media coverage, um, events, influencer marketing, collaborations, which could be with, you know, a charity, a nonprofit, or even a third party brand or a celebrity. Um, and then social media, I put a little asterisk here because this is new. So social media is just starting to kind of be roped in under a bit of the PR uh, toolkit, um, mostly because it's, you know, it's storytelling, which is really what PR is. It's communicating with the public. Um, it's, it's very journalistic in a sense, um, especially the way social media is going. So it kind of can be looped in this category as well. Um, so here's an example of all of these things working together to, to really, you know, make something incredible. So this was a project I got to work on in 2019. Um, you might have heard of it or, or saw it, or maybe you even visited. Um, this was at Kingsway Mall in Edmonton, and they partnered with an organization called PARC, um, which is an, an arts um, kind of collaboration organization where they, they help connect artists um, with kind of larger corporations. So they had this wacky idea that they were gonna take an empty space at Kingsway Mall and do this to it. So this is literally has been hand painted this entire room, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and we got to kind of, you know, behind the scenes, we knew this was all happening, it hadn't been revealed to the public yet, but we got to put together the, the PR um, strategy to unveil this. And so, um, within this project, we had media relations, so we had coverage in um, all of the major media outlets in Edmonton. Um, we had artist partnerships, so again, developing partnerships um, with kind of third-party people to help spread the word and, and build buzz. 
we did influencer marketing. So in the middle there, you'll see Miss Caroline Stokes, who is a fun kind of humorous Edmonton personality. Um, what we did actually is we reached out to people that we thought sort of painted outside the lines um, and kind of asked them, you know, would you star in our campaign? And they were very excited. We dressed them up in Kingsway outfits um, and they got to shoot inside the space and they got high res beautiful editorial photos at the end that they could share and we did kind of little stories and features on each of these personalities um, and then we held a media um, and influencer event so we invited a group of people to have a sit down dinner in the space and just an absolutely incredible night and experience um, if you were in Edmonton that night you could not miss this event on Instagram. It like blew up everyone's feeds. Everyone was talking about it. Um, and to this date, it's actually one of their most successful um, like social media hits, like with the impressions and reach that they got um, of any campaign they've ever done. So again, this is just to show when all of those things can kind of come together, um, they can have really, really big impact. So this was, I think, I can't remember how many people they think visited this the mall just to come to the space but it was quite incredible and uh, one of their most successful campaigns um so yeah so let's dive a little bit more deep now into what we're talking about when we say media coverage because i think this can be very mysterious to people um and back in the day it was almost like this was very behind the scenes no one talked about the fact that they had a publicist working for them they just oh yeah i just i just got on the cover of you know marie claire and it just happened it doesn't just happen. There's someone uh, working very hard behind the scenes to, to connect the dots, connect journalists with people um, and produce these kinds of stories. So we're going to we're going to reveal how some of this works for, for anyone who doesn't know. Um, so I love using this example. I've been using it since 2015 in all of my presentations. Um, and this is a, a story that popped up on National Geographic. Um, and it was a recap of like the best trips um, for best summer trips. And so beside places like, I need to check my notes here. Um, I think it was like, there was just like incredible locations. Um, who else is on here? Oh, Machu Picchu, Bermuda, Singapore. And then there was Edmonton. <laughs> so I saw this story and I was like, oh man, Good job, Edmonton tourism. Like, this is just incredible. Um, so, you know, how the heck does Edmonton end up on a list like this? No, no shade to Edmonton. I love living here. It's a great city. But like to be beside Machu Picchu as a, a summer trip is like, eh, it might, might be reaching a little bit. But anyway, so typically what's happened is someone at Edmonton tourism um, they've either, maybe they've flown um, this reporter, um, someone who works for National Geographic, a, a travel writer to Edmonton, they probably put together a trip for them, toured them around, let them experience it, and then, you know, stories like this happen. So there's someone who puts a lot of effort into creating this kind of media coverage, and it's really a symbiotic relationship between reporters and PR people like me. Um, we work together, we work together, they need content, I have clients um, who are looking for coverage and, and we work to make um, we work to make it happen. So that's just one example. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize how much of what they're viewing um, in traditional media coverage has has been pitched by publicists. A lot of it. A lot of it. Um, so why should we care? Why, what's the point of, you know, why would Edmonton Tourism do all that work to to get a, a piece in National Geographic? Well, I think it's mostly obvious, but when you're talking about smaller brands, and especially in the nonprofit world where you don't have a lot of budget, this is a very affordable way to get in front of people. And yes, there's this big conversation right now that newsrooms are dying and all of this, but it's, it's kind of not the full story. We are actually consuming more news today than we have ever in the history of time which makes sense because we, A, we have social media pushing news articles to us um, and there's just more outlets and it's a 24 seven news cycle. So there's pros and cons to that. Um, it means that there's technically there's more opportunity um, as there's more media publications than there kind of ever have been in a way, um, like especially niche and industry publications. Um, but it also means that there, there's a lot of noise. Um, so th there's pros and cons there, but really it's a very affordable, effective tool um, to build credibility and positioning around your company and, and make people aware of what, what you're doing. Um, this is a stat, it's probably a little bit outdated right now from the Content Marketing Institute, 
Um, 70% of consumers say they rather get to know a brand via, say, an article or a news story than necessarily an ad. And, and think about yourself. Think about how you, yes, you see ads, you see social media, you see all these different channels marketing towards you. But when you read an article about a company or an entrepreneur or an idea or a product, and it's kind of that journalistic, they take you through the story behind the brand and why they're doing the mission, that sticks with you. You know, some of the brands I remember the most are really because I've read like a, an article about them or a news story. Um, so it's very, very effective for brand name recognition um, and really building, building your story. Um, so this is just a quick example, also kind of more of the tangible results that you can see. Um, this is a client we had quite a few years ago, Candace Wolf Design. She's an interior designer, and she was kind of looking to get in front of um, empty nesters. So people who were, you know, downsizing or maybe renovating their houses, um, the kids have moved on, they have budget, um, they're looking to kind of make a change. So we worked with her on a PR strategy, like how do we get in front of um, that specific group who's, who's going to be looking to do these kinds of renovations? This is crazy. So we we knew, you know, they're probably watching Global Morning. Um, so Candace is on the show. She had about a four minute segment, got in her car, drove home. By the time she got home, <laughs> she had three voicemails, um, adding up to about $40,000 at work. So that like from a four minute segment on global news. And you know, that's only three calls at that, you know, quick, like very quickly. Um, but the ROI on that is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. Um, this is goes back to the the mural in Old Strathcona. This is our client Michael Maxis. Um, back in the day when Ryan Jesperson still had the show as 630 Ched, um, he was on the show talking about that mural project and saying, yeah, this is what we want to do and we want Edmontonians to rally behind it. And within this show, I think there was a $5,000 donation while he was still on the air, um, plus multiple other donations. Like it was, I think we reached like 10 grand after like I want to say 10 to 15 minute interview. Um, so it can, it can have like actual that ROI as well as this, you know, credibility and awareness and all those things. And there's, there's the mural in progress. Okay, so I've got you all excited about <laughs> doing media relations and getting press coverage. So how do you actually do this? So I'm gonna, again, peel back the curtain a little bit so that you can walk away today. And maybe if you wanna attempt this yourself, you can, um, or maybe you, know, maybe you wanna hire a, a PR team to do it for you if this, if this scares you, but I promise you, you can do it. So we, we need to think through a few, few pieces first. So who do you wanna talk to? This is really important. So if your demographic is, you know, 15 year old girls, you're not going on global news, right? That's not going to make sense for them. So you need to spend some time thinking, where is my consumer? Where, where do they, what news are they kind of consuming? Um, and that, and that's obviously who you're going to want to target instead of this kind of spray and pray kind of approach, you really want to be super specific. Um, and thinking, I guess, uh, quality over quantity. So once you've kind of identified this and done a little bit of research, um, then the next piece is what's your angle? This is the most important part of any media outreach you ever do. Um, and this is typically where we, <laughs> me as a publicist, have the hardest conversations um, with my clients because sometimes they'll come to me and say, you know, I sell t-shirts, uh, can you write me a press release? And I'm like, no one cares. <laughs> No one cares that you sell t-shirts and it's hard to tell a client that because they're very passionate about their business. Um, so you have to dig a little deeper. So maybe you sell t-shirts, but maybe it's made from organic cotton or maybe, you know, yeah, you have very ethical manufacturing processes or maybe you're donating a portion of sales to this charity or, you know, there's so many different, and you need to dig in. When it, and so we talked about brand. If you know your values, your purpose and your personality, this becomes very easy. Um, and you're able to say, okay, this is our angle. We can go to town with this, but this, you have to spend time. You have to be very objective about your business and think, why would anyone care about this pitch? It's not enough that you just exist as a business. There has to be a newsworthy or a timely angle um, that you can go to a journalist with um, that makes sense. And it, it's not, you know, it, it deserves airtime or, or whatever. 
So I, I want to show a quick example of this. So we've been working with Sweet Jolie, which is a local Edmonton brand for about four years. When Nicole came to me, she kind of said, I think I need PR, but I don't, I'm not really sure why, but I just know I need it. Um, so we were digging into her brand. She's, you know, a women's clothing boutique and she's, you know, I'm trying to get her to kind of open up about the purpose and the values and all that. And she's being very shy and not saying much. And finally, after, you know, a lot of process, she starts saying, you know, well, yeah, we, we partner with a lot of charities and, you know, women, women's groups, um, we're really about, you know, like women empowerment and self-esteem. And we've donated like thousands of dollars to charities and rally. And, and she's, and I'm like, what? I'm like, this is it. You know, this is the angle. This is what you need to lean into and don't be afraid or shy to lean into this storyline. Um, cause she felt very humble about it. And I think that's, also very common um specifically for entrepreneurs you know they just want to do the business they don't it feels awkward talking about yourself sometime but um working with nicole we were able to kind of turn that around and once we tapped into that story it just was like rocket fuel for the sweet jolie brand we were able to take it from honestly like from her basement to a brick and mortar location we we did a fundraising crowdfunding campaign raised over forty thousand um, dollars for her to have her first brick and mortar location um you know she's turned into a very successful brand um, i think we've done over 50 probably media placements for nicole over the last four years um and yeah she's just she's on the road to success and she's uh, a really inspiring entrepreneur um, okay, so we talked about your angle. So you know what your angle is, you know what you have to say and why people should care. Now you need to create a media list. So what's that mean? <laughs> it means that now that you, you know where your audience is and you're thinking about what publications or outlets that they might be consuming, you need to actually research journalists there. So this is a lot of work, but if you're doing it kind of consistently, um, it's not so bad this you might want to follow them on twitter um you you want to get familiar with what their work is and what they're writing about and kind of identify the right journalists at each outlet so i guess an example of this would be you know if i am pitching a story about you know a new restaurant is opening i don't pitch the arts journalist at the edmonton journal right i pitch the food columnist or if i'm you know a story about yeah a new um you know, change toothpaste is just launch. I don't, I don't email the homicide reporter. You know, I, I email the business reporter to say this new brand is just launched. This is a really great story. Um, so it's actually quite insulting to kind of email the wrong journalist. You, you really want to get familiar with who's out there and who's, who's in that media landscape and, and just have a real appreciation for their work and, and what they're interested in writing about, which will help you inform your angles and your pitch to them. Um, and then here we get to the pitch. So I show this to people often and it's, I think they get shocked how simple it actually can be. Um, this is literally kind of the formula when you're reaching out to a reporter. Hi, <laughs> you know, um, this is why I'm reaching out to you. This is why it's going to actually matter to your specific audience. Um, here's my product. Here's a little bit of background info. Maybe there's an image there. Um, and here's what I think we should do together. I'd love to come on the show. And would you be interested in interviewing me or interviewing the founder of the company? Um, and also, one thing I'll note here is really thinking about the medium. So when I'm pitching like an online or print publication, I actually pitch quite differently than I would pitch say like radio. So a print or online publication, you're gonna to wanna to attach images for sure. You wanna make it as easy as possible for that reporter to say yes and like just serve the story to them on like a silver platter because um, they're busy. And so if you make it easy, it's they'll say yes. Um, whereas radio, no, there's no visual. So what, what are you offering? paint the picture of what this story looks like depending on the medium that it's going to appear on and yeah it's really as easy as this um a little a few tips when you're pitching um please try not to do the mass email or your bcc um that works if you're like a huge brand you know if you're nike and you're making an announcement or if you're you know the mayor uh, mayor's office of a city and you're releasing an announcement sure you can do a bcc um, but typically typically for you know smaller organizations um you want to do a tailored approach you want to say you know hi journalist um reaching out today and you, you really want to customize the email so that they feel a little bit special um and that you're just going to be way more successful doing it that way um i think yeah email please don't call them that drives them crazy uh follow up once don't be entitled. 
don't be annoying um, or they'll just stop opening your emails, I promise you. <laughs> um, you, you gotta kind of take no for an answer and, and you'll get shot down a lot of times. Like that's just kind of the way it rolls. Um, okay, and then this goes back to brand. So if you don't have your website up to date or you're not kind of posting on social, but you have the social platforms but they're sitting empty and you're pitching a journalist, the first thing they do is Google your company. They look at your website, they look at your social, they poke around. If these things aren't up to date, it's a huge kind of red flag to them um, that they probably shouldn't cover the story or you might not be credible. Um, so again, having the brand foundations, all those things in place to kind of make you look legit are so important before you start doing outreach, uh, whether it's you know any kind of marketing effort that you're making um, because you just it could be totally wasted effort, which is really disappointing. Um, I'm going to touch really quickly on influencer marketing here. I hope, oh yeah, we have time. Um, so obviously very hot. <laughs> it's been growing in popularity over the last few years. People weren't sure if it was going to stick around, but it's definitely here to stay. But it's, it's changed a lot in the last few years. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hugely influential. <laughs> obviously it's called influencer marketing. Um, and it's a strategy that in combination with all the other marketing efforts that you make can be very, very powerful. And we have seen huge results for clients um, partnering with the right aligned influencers. So I wanted to touch briefly, cause I think there's a little bit sometimes of a misconception of what influencer marketing kind of has to look like. Um, so it doesn't need to look like this. So this is like, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be super fashionable people taking selfies, holding a coffee, like laughing into the wind. Um, it, it doesn't have to be that, right? It can be people that you admire, um, that you want to be kind of ambassadors for your organization or your cause. Um, they don't have to be, you know, fancy Instagram people. Um, it can really be, be anyone that, that makes sense for your company. So an example <laughs> is this is a hilarious little, campaign I did for Capital City Burlesque um, for a show that they did way back in the day. This might have been like, I think 2016, I did this project. They had very little budget, but I was like, okay, we're gonna make this work and we're gonna rally the community to sell tickets. It was their largest show they had ever planned. It was gonna be at the Citadel Theater in downtown Edmonton and they'd never had to try to sell, you know, that many tickets before. So it was a bit scary for them um, to try to, you know, make their money back from this venue rental. So what I did with my very limited dollars, I had to, to make magic happen. Um, we did media outreach first. So we, we landed media coverage, but then um, I went to the dollar store and I bought a, a, a couple packs of these stick on mustaches for like $2 each. <laughs> um, I reached out to local uh, Edmonton personalities who had, you know, what we call more like micro influencers. So they didn't have huge followings, but they had loyal followings of people who cared about what they did. Um, and these people are kind of champions for the arts. Maybe they work in performing arts. Um, Sarah Chan, obviously a piano teacher, very involved in the arts. Um, I sent them these mustaches in the mail. So in snail mail with a little letter that said, hey, when you rock um, this mustache, because I guess I should connect the dots here. The Capital City Burlesque show was like a mustache dad rock show. So they had a live band and the girls were dancing. Um, and so I thought that this would be funny. So yeah, all of these awesome local Edmonton personalities put on their stick on mustache and took to the internet um, and posted photos um, showing off their mustache pride and, and talking about the event and, and directing people to get tickets. And it was very successful. They sold out the show. It was the largest show they were ever, ever did. Um, and it was a super easy, like really it was, it was quite simple um, and fun. And you know, you look at these people, they might not be typical influencers necessarily, especially back then, um, but it, it worked. Um, so a, a few notes on influencer marketing. Um, don't get burned. This happens a lot. So sometimes I get so disheartened. Clients come to us and they're like, well, we did influencer marketing and, you know, it didn't work for us. And I just like, oh, it makes me sad. And, you know, that happens, it's possible. But typically the reason that an influencer collaboration doesn't work is because maybe it's just like the goals haven't been outlined or clearly communicated to the influencer. Maybe, you know, we haven't really involved them in the creative process of making that campaign come to life or that partnership. Um, and there's no contracts, there's no timelines, all this stuff, right? Or you don't even know, you know, maybe you don't have a way of tracking the results. 
Um, so create contracts, you know, they don't have to be crazy fancy or these like 40 page legal documents, just create an agreement. Um, there's lots of templates online that just say like, here's what we're agreeing to do as an organization. Here's what you're agreeing to do as the influencer. Here's when this needs to happen. Here's when we need to see the content published by you. If you're paying them or gifting them something, put that in the contract so it's really clear. Um, and then ask for data. So this is something a lot of brands don't do. They kind of say, you know, they're going to, I'll send you a t-shirt, post it, and then, you know, nothing happens. Um, but you're, you know, if you're in a relationship with an influencer, you are totally entitled to say to them, hey, do you mind sharing screenshots of the impressions? Um, or give them, for example, a a promo code or a unique URL that people can click through so that you can measure those relationships and then inform, um, that can inform what you do moving forward. So sometimes, um, you know, when we do campaigns with clients, we might do a partnership with like 10 different influencers for a campaign. And then we track all of that data. And then we might kind of say, ooh, okay, these few influencers, this performed really well. Their audience obviously is super aligned. Um, they get, they got this campaign, they got this product. Let's develop longer term partnerships with these people because we know it works and there's tangible ROI in the end. Um, so yeah, essentially look at influencers like you would, an, you know, like a billboard company. It's advertising. Um, so you would always, you would have a contract, right? If you were to buy a billboard, you'd have a contract. Um, there would be timelines, all of these things. So they essentially, they are just advertisers um, so you really need to kind of dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, one more quick thing, um, there are Canadian advertising standards that you need to adhere to when you're venturing into influencer marketing. Um, it's been pretty like wild west uh, the last few years until now, they're actually really starting to get much more strict um, and you need to really, you need to follow the rules. So you can go to their website, Advertising Standards of Canada. Um, they have all this information available to anyone who's uh, venturing in to these kinds of uh, marketing tactics. Um, but you basically need to disclose. So if you're paying or even gifting an influencer a product, for example, um, they absolutely need to disclose to their audience that what the relationship is. Um, this just protects consumers in Canada. So it's you know, it's your responsibility as a company to kind of know about these things. It's also the influencer's responsibility to know, but um, just make sure you're following the rules because you can you can get your hand slapped now and you they're they're getting more serious about it. Um, this is just a quick example um, of an influencer in Calgary. Um, and yeah, so you can see she has it right up at the front. It says ad. So you know that she's partnered with Dove um, and this is a paid sponsorship. Um, okay, so we've talked about that's Branding, we've talked about PR, you know the difference, you know what those things are, you know some of the tools that you can have in your tool belt uh, to really help. And now I wanna talk a little bit about advertising and then I think we'll move into our question period at the end here. So I'm not gonna do a whole spiel on like paid, especially digital marketing, like paid Facebook, Instagram ads. That's like, we could do a whole other presentation on that. And Gregory, we would love to like have, have us back and I'll have our digital marketing specialist do a full presentation. Um, but I just want to touch on, I guess, a few of the challenges that we see brands go through before that they come to us, um, specifically in Facebook and Instagram world. So going back, advertise. So PR is you know, word of mouth advertising in a way. Advertising is paid, right? It's paid marketing. You're paying someone money or you're paying a platform money um, to say that you're awesome or to publish your ad or creative. So this is, you know, a TV ad, right? A radio ad. But now obviously um, Instagram, Facebook is kind of, this is where I would encourage um, if you are say putting a lot of money into something like print right now, um, unless, you know, you might have a very specific case for it, I would really, really encourage you um, to start pushing some of those ad dollars over to social media advertising. Um, this is this is where it's at. Uh, this is definitely where you need to be focusing your efforts for both B2B and B2C brands. Um, this is where people are spending the majority of their time. Um, it's where you're going to be able to track things. Um, and it's really where you're going to be able to get the most um, most bang for your buck. I just see we have, do we have a question? I'll keep going. Um, so, 
Um, the biggest mistake whoops, that we see is that clients will come to us and they'll say, I tried boosting a post or I tried doing an ad campaign on Facebook and Instagram. It didn't work. I saw no results. And so typically the reason is that they have, they don't have this baby set up. So Facebook pixel, if you pro I'm hoping you probably know or you've heard of this. Um, this is the big brother <laughs> source. That's actually part of a lot of controversy right now. This is why Mark Zuckerberg is a very wealthy man is Facebook pixel. So what happens is um, this little code goes onto your website and essentially it tracks the data of users and people that interact with your ads and content on Facebook and Instagram. And it learns. So it's AI technology that's learning and learning and learning. And then basically what happens is the machine gets better and better and better at identifying who your customer is um, and pushing the ads to similar people. So for example, if I clicked on an ad, um, you know, it would see that I've clicked, it would understand who I am as a person based on my data online. And then it'd be like, oh, you know, my best friend might be very similar. It would start serving the ad to her. So this, it's like when this is set up and working properly and you have really defined audiences with your Facebook and Instagram, it's the ROI can be like insane. Like I, I, this is just really where you need to be focusing um, efforts if you have, if you have budget to do so. Um, and it really doesn't need to cost a lot. So I, I really wanted to touch on that today because I, I think that a lot of, um, especially entrepreneurs out there, they're trying to dabble in this world. Um, it is kind of specialized. It doesn't mean you can't learn how to do it on your own. You totally can. Um, but if it's not something you want to spend your time doing, just, you know, hire someone to do it. There's tons of great freelancers out there running uh, social apps ad campaigns um, or agencies like present post would be happy to help you um, but it's yeah it's very interesting but I will say rules are changing there's privacy laws coming we're not gonna be able to tra track as much data as we used to back in the day um, so it's not the be all end all this isn't the only thing you do as we said it's a soup right we have all these ingredients that work together um, to get the results that you're looking for so I just wanted to share a few examples before we go into our question period um, so for example, Sweet Julie, we, we run ads for her. Um, we have been for the last couple of years, I believe. And because we had a super, super strong brand presence and PR work that had been done for about like, I would say two or three years leading up to before we even started doing social ads, this was actually like kind of crazy. Um, we were doing numbers for Sweet Lee that like we had never even seen as a company because all of that groundwork had been done to really support the brand. Um, so like this is just, I grabbed five months worth of data. We did over 2,500 online purchases. Um, this is like the average return on ad spend. This is really where you want to the numbers you you want to be looking at or asking if you have someone working for you doing ads looking at is what's the average return on ad spend. Um, so at one point we were getting for every $1 that was put spent as ad budget, um, Sweet Julie was receiving about $70 in return. So that's really, really good ROI um, for something that's just like operating, right? Another example, we work with Sunterra Market. Um, we love Sunterra Market, grocery store based in Calgary and Edmonton. They just launched in Red Deer and we got to do the whole PR blitz for that, which was really fun. Um, and so similar, so we were doing, we do boosting, uh, so boost sponsored, boosts uh, on their social content as well as ad campaigns um, and in just a three-month period we we just did like absolutely extraordinary numbers for their business um, again I, I should say this was like you know COVID has changed things obviously online grocery was uh, a huge benefit but we were able to leverage um, that market and what was going on to really get some pretty crazy results so I think for most advertisers if you could spend a dollar and get 92 back you'd be pretty happy with that um, so I just wanted to show that to show the power I want to also say that like with Facebook and Instagram ads this doesn't happen overnight you need to let the machine there's a learning phase so it understands who your best audience is so it can direct those ads to them and, and get you these kinds of results. Um, but it's it's a worthwhile um, it's a worthwhile platform to invest in and, and, and start uh, increasing kind of your your play in this area if you're not doing it already. Um, so 
I rambled on. <laughs> I think I covered, you know, the top things I really wanted to chat about today and, and all of these marketing tactics that you all can employ. You absolutely can. These are the areas I really recommend focusing on. Um, I know that there's a whole other world of content marketing and social media and e-news campaigns and all of that stuff is important too. Um, but I think, you know, most people are doing that stuff already, but these are some of the areas where uh, we see clients need the most direction. So I hope that that was really helpful. Um, I'll just repeat, you know, my, my uh, intro, which is really, this is what we do. We build a brand, number one, we tell people about it, and then we just repeat that forever. <laughs> so I'm happy to take questions as well now.